last week I was at Agile 2014 and I heard a guy from Microsoft come up and give a keynote and he talked about sort of circa 2005, all the problems that they had, the stress of doing releases. These are, these are really, this is sort of a catalog of the reasons that you want to move to a more continuous process, um, stress, competition. And he talked about how they're uh, pretty far along the road to what he called second generation Agile. So let's learn about that. Um, I got this from Perforce. It's a survey they did of, of companies, many of whom are not SaaS companies. So if you're a SaaS or an online services company, you're going to have to go continuous. Your competitors are doing it. What if you're not? And they found that 51% of the people who are not SaaS companies were planning on moving to a continuous delivery or what I call a continuous agile process. So it's huge. Um, what I noticed about this is that if you're not a top technology company, you often think about Agile in a particular way, which is scrum teams, iterative releases, and even things like SAFE, Scaled Agile Framework, which is sort of building a hierarchy, um, a program management hierarchy on top of scrum. And uh, if you are a top technology company, you're actually doing something that's pretty different. A lot of the guys in the room are doing something that's pretty different. So we're going to uncover what that is, and I'm going to analyze it in terms of patterns. Um, there's, there's patterns that go with this. And the main thing to, to notice is that it, up until a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about the mythical man month problems, I call them. Programs and systems over a certain size just you can't do the project management, you can't deliver them correctly. And recently, unless you're the government, you hardly ever hear about this. So we've clearly found some silver bullet around this. And I'm just going to look at this from first principles of productivity. So one way to be more productive is to do the right thing. And we heard Jeremy come up here and say, half of the stuff that we do doesn't make it through to production. And that makes us a lot more productive. In fact, it doubles our productivity. So that's if you can do measurement of what people are actually using or what systems are actually working, and only focus on the 50% or less of them that people like or, or that actually works, then you can double your productivity. And if you do more frequent leases, you can get more of these measurements. And, um, increase your productivity even more. So that's sort of the, one of the first principles. And this, another one is, is a little more interesting. In the old style Agile, we talked a lot about organizing people. And there's a real limit to what you can do, the improvement in productivity you can get from organizing people. I call it mammoth management. So are we going to hunt mammoths down by the river or up on the mountain? Really, that discussion hasn't changed much over the, the thousands of years. But what is changing is the number of machines we use for things like build, test, and deploy. And if you look at software development productivity, by any measure, it's gone up probably 10 times in the last 20 years, what one developer can do. That's a huge increase in productivity. And I really think it's because we're using more machines. And we've shifted the conversation to the areas where we can use more machines, to this build, test, and deploy process. You're going to hear a lot about that in, in the later part of this this session. So um, uh, one way to think about it is John Henry and fighting the coal machine. When you look at coal mines now, they use these really, really big machines. Great way to get more productivity. Um, so automation is a foundation of continuous delivery. I'm going to quickly go through some of the basic patterns. Um, some of you guys are really familiar with this. And it's for some of you guys, this might be give you some hints. Uh, the I like to think about code contribution patterns. So continuous delivery is all about how you take a code change from a programmer, run it through tests, and somehow how get it built, test, and deployed. And one of the most common patterns is centralized continuous delivery. You put all of the code changes together in one system. You test them all together. It's sort of an early as possible strategy. Find all the problems as early as possible and fix them. And if you get something that passes, you have a release candidate. Some people, like Jez Humble, have said that's the only pattern. But in fact, that's not true. If you're, for instance, Assembly, I run a small SaaS company, you want to release every change. And you want to actually release the change before it hits problems in integration, interacting with other changes. So you might run a sort of a pattern where you have this little branch that you test, and then you deploy the change, and then you fit other changes in after it. You sort of make the integration somebody else's problem. That allows you to release every change. So there's a lot of options here. Um, one that I'm going to talk a lot about is what I call Maxos, or Matrix of Services. 
And this is essentially a combination of the two. You do code review inside the team that's building one web service, and you come up with a release candidate for that. And then you throw it over into a centralized continuous integration system and make sure it, work, it works with everything else in the company. If it does work, you promote it to production. So that's going to be the building block. Here's another strategy that you're going to need, test layering. Why do we do batch releases? Because we need to test our release candidate. We need some time to test it. If you have only three minutes to test something, that process of testing your release candidate isn't going to work. But you can actually get any level of quality you want by adding enough layers of testing. And I think it's sort of interesting to observe that um, every software change goes through these layers of unit testing, code review, human QA, goes through some of these layers. You may add and remove layers as you want to increase quality or increase speed. So you have a sort of a pretty precise control over your level of quality. Um, it's interesting to note, if you're implementing this, that you actually implement these test layers from the top down, sort of in the opposite way, if you think about it sequentially, that, that you run the tests. Um, this is an actual example from Edmonds. They have nine test layers. If you have this many test layers, you're not going for code coverage. So I think code coverage is one of those things. There's a lot of things that are on the way out, along with sort of scrum and safe. Code coverage might be one controversial statement. But you, what you want is you want a place to put any given test. Another thing I would observe about this, if you have enough of these test layers in place, computers can write software. So that's in our future, right? They can write software. And it may not be good code, but It'll work if it makes it through. Crowdsourcers can write software. Another fundamental tenet of continuous delivery is developer responsibility. It's a very strong pattern that the developers decide when to release something, and they don't go through a QA gate. If you let them throw something over the wall to QA, they're going to get lazy. If you force them to actually think about quality and decide when something's ready to release, they're going to go back, and they're going to help you with things like code review and automated testing and DevOps. That's how you make it work. Um, and so there's a sort of restructuring of roles where the QA guys become consultants to the developers, and actually very valued consultants, because they, they, they cover a lot of butts. Um, another thing that I often see here is that teams are not multifunctional, truly from the sense of being multifunctional, self-managed teams. You can start with a developer, a tech lead, and he can run this process and bring in expertise as needed. That's very important if you have to scale and scale quickly, because multifunctional teams take a long time to bake, and it's hard to get all those functional people out of your organizations. Uh, another basic tactic is feature switches or feature gates. You're going to be releasing your code all the time, but if you release your code every day and it takes you a month to build something, you have to hide it for 29 days before you show it to people. And in fact, features end up going through a whole series of stages where they're shown to testers, shown to beta testers, maybe A-B testing. This is a really, import, really, really important tactic. Um, and then finally, at the end, what I call the unveil. So you're going to be separating release from launch. Your marketing and product managers are going to be able to say when you unveil. But the developers are going to drive this release process. If you're a product manager, your life is very different. So not only are you moving from batch to continuous, so you're always under the gun. Um, it's a lot more work to do product management in this situation, but it's also you're going to get a much better result. You're doing more work to get a better result. You're moving from a situation where you're delivering requirements to delivering user experience. And you're moving from a situation where you're doing strategy and essentially forecasting. How will this work to actually just directly measuring what's happening? <clears throat> 